Patriarchs and Prophets, Chapter 56 Eli and His Sons Eli was priest and judge in Israel. He held the highest and most responsible positions among the people of God. As a man divinely chosen for the sacred duties of the priesthood and set over the land as the highest judicial authority, he was looked up to as an example and he wielded a great influence over the tribes of Israel. But although he had been appointed to govern the people, he did not rule his own household. Eli was an indulgent father. Loving peace and ease, he did not exercise his authority to correct the evil habits and passions of his children. Rather than contend with them or punish them, he would submit to their will and give them their own way. Instead of regarding the education of his sons as one of the most important of his responsibilities, he treated the matter as of little consequence. The priest and judge of Israel had not been left in darkness as to the duty of restraining and governing the children that God had given to his care. But Eli shrank from this duty because it involved crossing the will of his sons and would make it necessary to punish and deny them. Without weighing the terrible consequences that would follow his course, he indulged his children in whatever they desired, and neglected the work of fitting them for the service of God and the duties of life. God had said of Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. But Eli allowed his children to control him, the father became subject to the children. The curse of transgression was apparent in the corruption and evil that marked the course of his sons. They had no proper appreciation of the character of God or of the sacredness of his law. His service was to them a common thing. From childhood they had been accustomed to the sanctuary and its service, but instead of becoming more reverent, they had lost all sense of its holiness and significance. The father had not corrected their want of reverence for his authority, had not checked their disrespect for the solemn services of the sanctuary, and when they reached manhood, they were full of the deadly fruits of skepticism and rebellion. Though wholly unfit for the office, they were placed as priests in the sanctuary to minister before God. The Lord had given the most specific directions in regard to offering sacrifices, but these wicked men carried their disregard of authority into the service of God and did not give attention to the law of the offerings, which were to be made in the most solemn manner. The sacrifices pointing forward to the death of Christ were designed to preserve in the hearts of the people faith in the Redeemer to come. Hence, it was of the greatest importance that the Lord's directions concerning them should be strictly heeded. The peace offerings were especially an expression of thanksgiving to God. In these offerings, the fat alone was to be burned upon the altar. A certain specified portion was reserved for the priest, but the greater part was returned to the offerer to be eaten by him and his friends in a sacrificial feast. Thus, all hearts were to be directed, in gratitude and faith, to the great sacrifice that was to take away the sin of the world. The sons of Eli, instead of realizing the solemnity of this symbolic service, only thought how they could make it a means of self-indulgence. Not content with the part of the peace offering allotted them, they demanded an additional portion. And the great number of these sacrifices presented at the annual feast gave the priests an opportunity to enrich themselves at the expense of the people. They not only demanded more than their right, but refused to wait even until the fat had been burned as an offering to God. They persisted in claiming whatever portion pleased them, and if denied, threatened to take it by violence. This irreverence on the part of the priest soon robbed the service of its holy and solemn significance, and the people abhorred the offering of the Lord. The great antitypical sacrifice to which they were to look forward was no longer recognized. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. These unfaithful priests also transgressed God's law 
and dishonor their sacred office by their vile and degrading practices. Yet they continue to pollute by their presence the tabernacle of God. Many of the people, filled with indignation at the corrupt course of Hophni and Phinehas, cease to come up to the appointed place of worship. Thus, the service which God had ordained was despised and neglected because associated with the sins of wicked men, while those whose hearts were inclined to evil were emboldened in sin. Ungodliness, profligacy, and even idolatry prevailed to a fearful extent. Eli had greatly erred in permitting his sons to minister in holy office. By excusing their course on one pretext and another, he became blinded to their sins, but at last they reached a pass where he could no longer hide his eyes from the crimes of his sons. The people complained of their violent deeds, and the high priest was grieved and distressed. He dared remain silent no longer. But his sons had been brought up to think of no one but themselves, and now they cared for no one else. They saw the grief of their father, but their hard hearts were not touched. They heard his mild admonitions, but they were not impressed, nor would they change their evil course, though warned of the consequences of their sin. Had Eli dealt justly with his wicked sons, they would have been rejected from the priestly office and punished with death. Dreading thus to bring public disgrace and condemnation upon them, he sustained them in the most sacred positions of trust. He still permitted them to mingle their corruption with the holy service of God and to inflict upon the cause of truth an injury which years could not efface. But when the judge of Israel neglected his work, God took the matter in hand. There came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice, and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed for ever. God charged Eli with honoring his sons above the Lord. Eli had permitted the offering appointed by God as a blessing to Israel to be made a thing of abhorrence, rather than bring his sons to shame for their impious and abominable practices. Those who follow their own inclination in blind affection for their children, indulging them in the gratification of their selfish desires, and do not bring to bear the authority of God to rebuke sin and correct evil, make it manifest that they are honoring their wicked children more than they honor God. They are more anxious to shield their reputation than to glorify God, more desirous to please their children than to please the Lord, and to keep His service from every appearance of evil. God held Eli, as a priest and judge of Israel, accountable for the moral and religious standing of His people and, in a special sense, for the character of his sons. He should first have attempted to restrain evil by mild measures. But if these did not avail, he should have subdued the wrong by the severest means. He incurred the Lord's displeasure by not reproving sin and executing justice upon the sinner. He could not be depended upon to keep Israel pure. Those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through indolence or lack of interest make no effort to purify the family or the church of God, are held accountable for the evil that may result from their neglect of duty. We are just as responsible for the evils that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral authority as if the acts had been our own. 
Eli did not manage his household according to God's rules for family government. He followed his own judgment. The fond father overlooked the faults and sins of his sons in their childhood, flattering himself that after a time they would outgrow their evil tendencies. Many are now making a similar mistake. They think they know a better way of training their children than that which God has given in His Word. They foster wrong tendencies in them, urging as an excuse, They are too young to be punished. Wait till they become older and can be reasoned with. Thus, wrong habits are left to strengthen until they become second nature. The children grow up without restraint, with traits of character that are a lifelong curse to them, and are liable to be reproduced in others. There is no greater curse upon households than to allow the youth to have their own way. When parents regard every wish of their children and indulge them in what they know is not for their good, the children soon lose all respect for their parents, all regard for the authority of God or man, and are led captive at the will of Satan. The influence of an ill-regulated family is widespread and disastrous to all society. It accumulates in a tide of evil that affects families, communities, and governments. Because of Eli's position, his influence was more extended than if he had been an ordinary man. His family life was imitated throughout Israel. The baleful results of his negligent, ease-loving ways were seen in thousands of homes that were molded by his example. If children are indulged in evil practices, while the parents make a profession of religion, the truth of God is brought into reproach. The best test of the Christianity of a home is the type of character begotten by its influence. Actions speak louder than the most positive profession of godliness. If professors of religion, instead of putting forth earnest, persistent, and painstaking effort to bring up a well-ordered household as a witness to the benefits of faith in God, are lax in their government and indulgent to the evil desires of their children, they are doing as did Eli, and are bringing disgrace on the cause of Christ and ruin upon themselves and their households. But great as are the evils of parental unfaithfulness under any circumstances, they are tenfold greater when they exist in the families of those appointed as teachers of the people. When these fail to control their own households, they are, by their wrong example, misleading many. Their guilt is as much greater than that of others, as their position is more responsible. The promise had been made that the house of Aaron should walk before God forever, but this promise had been made on condition that they should devote themselves to the work of the sanctuary with singleness of heart, and honor God in all their ways, not serving self nor following their own perverse inclinations. Eli and his sons had been tested, and the Lord had found them wholly unworthy of the exalted position of priest in his service. And God declared, Be it far from me. He could not accomplish the good that he had meant to do them because they failed to do their part. The example of those who minister in holy things should be such as to impress the people with reverence for God and with fear to offend him. When men, standing in Christ's stead, to speak to the people God's message of mercy and reconciliation, use their sacred calling as a cloak for selfish or sensual gratification. They make themselves the most effective agents of Satan. Like Hophni and Phinehas, they cause men to abhor the offering of the Lord. They may pursue their evil course in secret for a time, but when at last their true character is exposed, the faith of the people receives a shock that often results in destroying their confidence in religion. There is left upon the mind a distrust of all who profess to teach the word of God. The message of the true servant of Christ is doubtfully received. The question constantly arises, Will not this man prove to be like the one we thought so holy and found so corrupt? Thus the word of God loses its power upon the souls of men. In Eli's reproof to his sons are words of solemn and fearful import, words that all who minister in sacred things would do well to ponder. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Had their crimes injured only their fellow men, the judge might have made reconciliation by appointing a penalty 
and requiring restitution, and thus the offenders might have been pardoned. Or, had they not been guilty of a presumptuous sin, a sin offering might have been presented for them. But their sins were so interwoven with their ministration as priests of the Most High in offering sacrifice for sin, the work of God was so profaned and dishonored before the people that no expiation could be accepted for them. Their own father, though himself high priest, dared not make intercession in their behalf. He could not shield them from the wrath of a holy God. Of all sinners, those are most guilty who cast contempt upon the means that heaven has provided for man's redemption, who crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. The end of chapter 56 of Patriarchs and Prophets.